come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hello, and thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. That's right. It's the movie review podcast that you can't get enough of. We come at you every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination you can help us out with that goal by all you got to do really is go over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button write us a review hit the little uh notification for new episodes so you know get your podcast we'll just automatically download to your phone all that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you who are into the same kind of movies that we are we same are weird the weird shit we'd like that's right oh. <laughs> the same weird Stuff. same weird shit uh well you're wondering who's talking to you these are the internet radio superstars holly hey. michaela john <laughs> and i'm colin and tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by john what did we watch tonight uh we watched 2001's 13 ghosts ah uh, directed Thir- by Thir- <laughs> 13 teen i guess how it's <laughs> <laughs> Thir- uh, directed by uh, Steve Beck. Who we know from? His only other movie, Ghost Ship. Uh, so you might so, not know him. So he had a niche. Uh, he, yeah, for a very short <laughs> while. I think this was in, like, within two years. Yeah. Ghost Ship was his next movie. So you um, think he was like, I've made my mark, I'm done. Yes, he's done. He he's <laughs> went off into a field somewhere. And just he like, sailed off on now. a ghost ship. Did he, yeah. go, did, he go back to, uh, <laughs> did he go back to visual effects? Or did he just I like? I know. Done? I know he came from visual effects. He worked at ILM for a while. I'm. Sh- I, there's no other credits for him. I don't think. Oh wow! Wait, let me look. At my, let me see. Well, Steve Beck, what have you been doing? Yeah, because um, I think visual I was telling effects. you guys last week, like when I had looked him up, like at the time that Thirteen Ghosts came out, it kind of struck me that usually they recruit, you know, directors out of film school to do these things. But Steve Beck's, it kind of struck. He was in his 40s, I think, when he made 13, when he became a movie director, when he made 13 yeah. years. No, the last visual effects thing he did was The Hunt for Red October. So, Pre- oh. this. so really, so he became, it was a visual effects guy who became a movie director, made two movies and then quit the business. As far as we know, <laughs> basically, he, I'm not kidding when I said he walked off into a field and was just never seen again. Wow. Um, ooh, I just saw this. You'll like this, Michaela. Uh, main title design artist for the movie 1984's Breakin. Oh, that is a good title design. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. We've got him for that. He should stick to his lane, man. <laughs> he did. Uh, I think he did just record a new commentary for the 13 Ghosts Blu ray that's coming out. So he's still oh, alive. Course. Oh, wow. So they found him, maybe living in the woods like the fucking Unabomber. Oh, so we're going to find out whatever happened to Steve Beck, yeah. master craftsman, director of 13 Ghosts and Ghost Ship. This movie comes at us, uh, you know, if you've been listening to this show for a while, uh, we're going to throw some names at you that you've heard us talk about before. One of those is Dark Castle Productions. Yeah, I promise I'm not trying to, like, get in the William Castle like don't believe groove. it i just am um just where i'm at right now but well, it's uh, yeah, amazing that it shows what kind of influence <laughs> that that guy had william castle we watched bug was your last uh movie pick that was yeah the, the last movie that william castle actually directed um but, uh, i think he produced it he didn't direct it. oh that's right sorry he produced it um but dark castle right is the company that kind of spun off from tales from the crypt Right? Mm. Can you explain uh, the linkage there? From Tales from the Crypt? Uh, It's uh, the producers on it, right? Isn't this like a whole um, Zemeckis and um, I'm forgetting all the names here. Joel Silver. Joel Silver, yeah. yeah. And uh, Gilbert Adler, who was the guy who basically oversaw, I think he was like the the close to the ground, uh, boots on the ground producer for Tales from the Crypt. And then those other guys, you know, Robert Zemeckis and Joel Silver, were the uh, the big time money men, um, but th- you know they started doing those Tales from the Crypt movies, and then they moved off and formed their own company. Well, they did the Tales from the Crypt TV show also, and formed their own company called. Uh, well, they had their own other companies too, Silver Pictures and whatever Zemeckis right. has, Image Movers or I can't remember, but um, they formed Dark Castle, 
which was originally supposed to be the reason it got its name is it was supposed to be doing these remakes of William Castle movies. So the first one was House on Haunted Hill, which came out in 1999. We did an episode on that. You can go back and listen to that. And then so this was 2001 uh, remake mm-hmm. of William Castle's 13 Ghosts. What was yep. the third movie that they did? Was I think it it's Ghost, Ghost Ship? Ship. Hold okay. on. I'm I was going to say, it's, I, my bet would be Ghost Ship. I'm yeah. pretty sure it's Ghost Ship. I think it was. So that bears the title of a Val Luton movie, but doesn't share any of the plot uh, with it. It's a completely new thing. That um, So that's where they were like, okay, we're done doing the William Castle movie. So they did two William Castle remakes, and then they started making their own thing. They did a remake of House of Wax. Uh, which isn't really a remake of House of Wax, the 53 Vincent Price movie. It's actually a remake almost of oh, Tourist Wax Trap. Wax. What? Well, never mind. It's a remake of something else, like you were saying. Yeah, Tourist right. Trap, I think, is what it bears the most. Wax Mask is an Italian movie that's a remake of House right. of Wax. And it turns out House of Wax is a remake of the mystery of the Wax Museum with Fay Ray from way back in the day. Uh, they also did, am I right, they did Gothica. Yes. The movie with Halle Berry that she did right after she won the Academy Award for Monsters Ball, and it had Robert Downey Jr. pre Iron Man. And this that, is not a good resume. That movie is <laughs> bad. Yeah, I saw that one in theaters. We've Gothica talked about that before. It's, it's a bad movie. I forgot about that movie. <laughs> is Dark Castle okay. still around? I can't remember if I if I saw their logo on. Uh, it wasn't their logo was on Rock and Rolla? The yes. um. I was going to say Guy Ritchie movie. It is a Guy Ritchie movie, isn't it? It is a Guy Ritchie movie. movie. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's, I love that movie. <laughs> it's one of my favorites of his. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I think it's still out there. I don't think they produced anything recently. It doesn't look like it. Uh, 2014, I think, is the last one they produced. What'd they do? do, 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 do. Was the that Loft. Uh, they also did The Losers, Bullet to the Head, The Reaping, um, with Hillary Swank. Oh, that's right. Oof, Boy. that's a lot of bad movies. Oh, Hills Run Red, Return to House and Haunted Hill. Oh, wow. So The more you talk, the worse it gets. Yeah. Splice. The more I'm inspired Splice. for my future picks. <laughs> Splice. Orphan. They did Orphan. Oh, okay. All right. That's a little bit. That they redeemed themselves a little bit. You got a little better. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the goal of the company was to kind of make these mid-budget, um, you know, I mean, which is basically big-budget horror movies. Um Mid budget to uh, to regular Hollywood, but like to horror movies, that was quite a you know chunk of change. You know what the budget was on Thirteen Ghosts? Looking it up right now. The um, and a lot of times, at least starting with, and I guess this is the thing that anyone who's seen this movie is going to talk about. Uh, starting with House on Haunted Hill, it seemed like there's a focus on the architecture. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say so, that, yes. I was gonna say there was a lot of this movie that felt a lot of like House on Haunted Hill. Uh, Forty-two million was the budget. So that's a lot, at least compared to now so, on the Blumhouse model, right? Right. Well, it's two thousand one money. Yeah. Or two thousand, I guess. So it's like what the equivalent of like a fifty thousand or fifty million dollar movie now, or something like that. Probably. Yeah. Let's see what the budget on. Oh, the budget on. Guess what the budget on House on Haunted Hill was. Less. Forty million. Thirty million. Nineteen million. Jesus, what? So, and because that one was uh, a, a modest hit and made about forty point eight million, um, I guess they're like up the budget. Yeah, you play <laughs> off of the success of your last uh, you hit, I guess. And so, Thirteen Ghosts was the sophomore. Uh, oh, and apparently that didn't do so good because Ghost Ship was twenty million, so yeah. they went back down for the next one. <laughs> I don't recall like Ghost Ship. Did it have like a standout production design or set design? I don't think it's I've just basically seen like a ship. Anything but the beginning of that movie. Yeah, and Gothica is set in an insane asylum, and that didn't look all that. But House no. of Wax is maybe you know if you're going to pick the three Dark Castle movies that have an accent on architecture and set design, where there's standouts, right? Yeah, it's House on Haunted Hill and its Art Deco thing. Thirteen Ghosts with its. Uh, you know uh, whatever the glass is like crazy Rubik's cube glass house. And yep. uh, House of Wax with the amazing melting uh, wax house. It's a literal House of Wax in the, <laughs> in the remake. We, w- we so would have been like we would have been reminded of that if Sean had actually brought it when he promised he would. I, I would have preferred to watch that Dark Castle movie. <laughs> Not about what you prefer. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sean is issue. scratching. I mean, it's twice, this through. shows twenty five percent about what I would prefer. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes, this is my twenty percent, and I hoard it. Um, okay, and so, I will make the mistakes that I make, and you will let me do it. <laughs> well, why don't you? Uh, I'm sure you know. I mean, this is, you know, anyone who said, like I said, this is the thing that you're going to talk about. Probably if you've seen this movie. Or at least it's the thing that you're going to remember. It's very distinct. I mean, I know before we go into it, uh, Joel Silver, the producer, um, I know that he's an architecture nut. You know, I mean, like he, his dream project in life is to make a movie about the life of Frank Lloyd Wright. I think he lives in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. He's all Frank Lloyd Wright this and Frank Lloyd that right that. I've heard interviews where he's talked about Frank Lloyd Wright. So it's like architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright actually designed the house that the original uh house on haunted hill was filmed in in los angeles um, has he done any like um any work about frank like frank lloyd wright has he actually done anything it seems like this wouldn't be too hard yeah, yeah i feel like maybe he should look into a documentary <laughs> yeah right and try not to do like a feature film on the you know but yeah you know. Um, so what's well, what's the love this movie then with this house what can you tell us about this house uh just the house. You want me to tell you about it? I mean, it's a, it's a glass shifting enclosure. Uh, most of it's see-through. There's some metal to it. Um, it shifts uh, over time. It's got uh, containments. It's got spells in the walls surrounding it. So, like, etched on glass panels. Yes. Um, Etchings in it. It's a pretty cool house. I like it. It is. A, I mean, it's a striking uh, production design, a set. I mean, yes. uh, you're never, I, you, I have never seen anything like it. I mean, it is, uh, something to behold. It, it's pretty impressive. It really is. Would you live in it? You God, no. <laughs> well, if my creepy uncle left me a glass <laughs> house, I'd sell it. Yeah. Fuck like, that. No, like that's great. Let's but good luck, weird house good luck selling over. that. You're never oh, going to get fire. Be- you're never going to get a buyer for that shit. Some rich eccentric would look at that thing and be like, oh, I must have it. And it'd be gone in a minute. Yeah. Well, you it does hope. have, it does have, because we're sitting there going, it's a glass house. Like people can watch you poop, you know, but uh, the, the <laughs> frosted glass on the bathrooms and apparently the outside does have these slide up shields that can be triggered uh, for privacy. Uh, the house is designed by... <laughs> Like the bathrooms have like frosted windows and and that kind of thing, but the rooms don't. You can see right in all the rooms. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so but they're in the woods, surrounded by no one. I'll be fine. I don't want anyone I live with to see in my room. That's my room. That's true. This also makes the movie kind of impractical because a lot of the middle section of the film is the characters racing around trying to find people who are lost in the house, and it's like it's a house with glass walls. And I think one character actually says. How can you lose your family in a gla- a house made of glass? Because they're like, yeah, yeah Matthew kind of Lillard said that it actually made me laugh pretty hard. Yeah, I was like, that's a valid point. Well, this is designed it's, it's, by a guy dark. named uh, it's dark in some areas. Sean Hargraves is the production designer. I mean, he's gone on to work on like uh, the Jurassic movies, uh, the star, the latest Star Wars movie. Uh, apparently, it was based on the architecture of the New York Science Museum. It uh, used more than three miles of etched glass walls and a total of eighty-five thousand, or sorry, eighty-five hundred square feet of glass Damn. were used, and five tons of steel to build this set. You mentioned the four assistants that had to constantly be like windexing all the glass for the <laughs> shot. <laughs> yeah. That was some poor underpaid assistant's job. <laughs> yeah, now it just looks like a big Apple store. And Basically, they, they blow it up at the end of the movie, unfortunately. But uh, unfortunately, yeah. OK, so who stars in this movie and uh, what's it about? What's going on? Well, I mean, wait, first of all, um, we did say that this is a remake of the original movie. Anybody seen the 1960 13 Ghosts? No. Yeah, it's actually it's I think it's only like a 71 minute movie and it's actually pretty darn good. And it has I would recommend it. basically the same skeletal structure as this one. I mean, it's um, yeah, plot wise mostly. I know, you know uh, it's definitely it's, been updated for uh, today's. There was no giant glass house in the original, but there are ghosts uh, in containment within the house. Somebody inherits a house. There's a fortune hidden within the house. Uh, the, the original has a built-in nanny that comes with the house, and that's played by the witch. 
from The Wizard of Oz. Margaret Hamilton is in it. But the thing that uh, William Castle, and we've talked about this on the previous episodes we've done about him, employed gimmicks whenever he made these movies and marketed them. And 13 Ghosts, you know what the gimmick was for 13 Ghosts, Sean? Uh, wasn't it Illusiono? It was. And what does that do and how does it work? Illusiono. Um, during the screenings of the movie, um, certain times the audience would be directed to put on special glasses um, when I believe when characters in the movie did it as well, but this would allow you to see the ghosts on the movie. I don't know the specifics of it. Something to that effect. Yeah, they recreated it on a DVD that was real. I don't know if this is out on Blu-ray, but there was a DVD where they had a version where you could watch it and it came with collectible you know, glasses. But basically they're the red and the blue lenses kind of like a 3d glasses but they're like uh it's like the blue bar goes all the way across the top so you can you know it covers both eyes and the red bar is below it and the idea being that you could you know they'd color the screen blue but if you put the blue filter up to your eyes it would filter out the blue and you could see the red ghost that was in there or vice versa if you put the red filter up the ghost would disappear you know so you could if you're too scared you could Put the thing on and not see the ghosts. <laughs> or if you wanted to see the ghosts, you could, uh, you know, look through the I other like viewer. Gimmick. Yeah. So this, this, this reminds cool. me of, uh, do you guys remember that stretch in the 90s where TGIF did the 3D episodes? Yeah. Yeah. They would have the icon oh, wow. come up when you were supposed to put your glasses on. And it, all, it was always just like Tim Allen, like swinging a two by four. Oh, I remember those and episodes. They just, and yeah. the three the three D glasses like just came in the newspaper with the go section. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They do that like every old days of television. Television. Yeah, they television. used to do that like oh, every yeah. ten years or so. Because I mean, I remember. Why well, wasn't or maybe it was that same night? There was an episode of Medium that was in three D that came in the glasses, and was it the same night? Or I I remember I distinctly remember Home Improvement, and I think maybe Boy Meets World. Yeah, it was a TJF uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, um, so I missed opportunity that this movie was too early for the 3D resurgence that came after 2009. But uh, the movie does borrow, in order to pay homage to that gimmick, and incorporate something into the movie itself. And what's that? I'm sorry, I was looking something up. I missed your question. Oh, well, I was going to say, like, it, it bar- in order to pay homage to the, uh, the gimmick, the William Castle oh, yeah. gimmick, what does the movie do to uh, to reference that? Uh, there's they have special glasses in the movie that allow them to see the ghosts around them. Special I would light up I would glass. say to you that this Spectre is vision. a lot yeah. less exciting <laughs> than so if stupid. I were get to work. <laughs> but they make a plot point. It's like, yep, the characters in the movie can see the ghosts if they put these things on that look like Google Glass or something. Yeah. They're just like uh, you know. Um, so just don't put them on. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing that I didn't quite understand with this is because they have to put the glasses on in order to see the ghosts, and then we as the audience get to see what they're seeing, but we still don't really get good solid looks at these ghosts because the editor continues to, like, he'll shoot a couple frames of the ghost with the wind in its hair and coming up toward the camera and then intercuts that with, like, the empty space that the ghost Mm -hmm. is occupying, and then we'll cut back to the ghost and then cut back to the empty space in a series of flash frames that are accompanied by uh, loud, you know, noises that sound like people unsheathing swords or something like that. (laughs) Um, It has a very, like, late 90s, early 2000s distinct editing style that I'm not really into. Describe this editing style for our younger viewers who haven't experienced this enthralling era of cinema. But it's like you're saying, they just like they cut to something really quick. It's really loud. It's it's really fast paced or like they speed up the film for like a second, you know, to give it that like herky jerky movement. And then like that's it. And then you, they just cut back to the person reacting to seeing the ghost, which is really not that exciting to watch. This happens a lot. And they do a lot of slow motion. There's you know, a so lot. It, there's a lot of variable speeds, but you're cutting between shots that have variable speeds. There's these yeah. things which at the time, and I know I've used the term before, but this was called the avid fart, uh, which basically it means because you're cutting electronically and you can get down there into the f- actual frames, they, they're cutting in like flash frames of, um, you know, like Latin writing that's glowing. 
and then like a flash frame of a ghost and then like a flash frame of something else and it's just like you know usually accompanied by that kind of sound effect um (laughs) it's very hyper and over stylized but like i almost and i don't know if you agree with this but i almost had the uh, uh it had the effect of a annoying me and b i never you know certain things never seemed to fully register because they didn't linger on them a- enough. It was just like, kapow, pow, pow, pow. I'm like, okay, I got an impression of something that I saw. And yeah, then, I agree. And then it was, I, I don't, I don't understand why you would make such a point in this movie of being like, our characters have to wear glasses to see these things and not give us like more POV shots. Right. Or good looks at the creatures. I mean, I guess yeah. I can kind of tell what they look like. Uh, the idea being that there's 12 specters, 12 spirits trapped in the, in cages, basically in the bottom of this house, right? These have been <laughs> rounded up and we'll have to get to who they are because they each have a distinctive name and personality, apparently expounded upon in DVD extra features that aren't actually in the movie. They have backstories, but um, yes. these have been caught by uh, plot mover Cyrus. What was his last name? Criticos. Cyrus Criticos. This is played by F. Murray Abraham, who is the guy who killed Mozart. And oh, that's right. Uh, he, <laughs> we're inducting him into the uh, Saturday Night Freak Show Hall of Fame. Uh, thanks to MF Mad uh, for letting us know. He was in Last Action Hero as the guy Practice. who killed Mozart. <laughs> practice yes. he was in the grand budapest hotel which i still can't believe that we did on this show and 13 ghosts i love that movie <laughs> it's a very good movie yeah it's a very good movie it's very high i brow. love that movie <laughs> that's right we got high brow and low brow if you continue to watch or listen to the saturday night pre-show we promise podcast. to stick with the low brow <laughs> um do we <sighs> <laughs> we're gonna see what next week's movie is i guess okay so uh cyrus goes around uh, collecting ghosts. What? Uh, well, he's also With the accompanying help of Matthew Lillard. That's right. Matthew Lillard is. Uh, so what? What? What's Matthew Lillard's function? What is he? Because there's like it's like a ghost busting team. It's, well, he's the psychic. He's the one who can feel the energy of the spiritual energy of ghosts and people at the same time. So he he's got these uh, uh, he's got these powers that allow him to help Cyrus find these ghosts. Yeah, and that, of course, means that his power is accompanied by these rapid-fire uh, imagery, f- avid fart edits again, uh, yes. which are designed to drive you, the audience, just completely out of your mind. Um, right, is I it was, just was me? Else fe- feeling the pain that Matthew Lillard was feeling? <laughs> like, ah, oh, I'm constantly touching the back of my head because it hurts. <laughs> Well, I think like at one point they were talking about like this movie could cause seizures or something because uh, of. I would think so. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I mean, did this? Yeah, I mean, it does have like a strobing effect. Was this? Uh, I mean, psychologically, because this is always the question that I ask when they employ these kind of techniques. It's like, are you doing this because you're trying? You don't have faith in the actual scene that you shot to be scary or emotional or whatever. And so you're punching up the excitement by giving us visual stimulation in the form of, you know, rapid fire images that are supposed to some, you know, it's supposed to have some kind of psychological effect. But with me, it annoys me. That is the primary response that I have to it. I mean, what about you guys? I mean, do you go like, oh, I, you know, I feel anxious because of this is happening or that's scary. Whoa, watch out. There's all this. I don't think they, uh, uh, I think they it was very purposeful what they were doing. I don't think they lacked confidence in what they had. I think this was exactly what they were going for, was that kind of mood and that kind of, like, this is how we build tension. We just keep them on their toes by constantly, like, a barrage of sights and sounds. No, that's not- I, I, it, it can be. It can be unnerving. It's just when you do it the entire movie, it's it's not as effective as they want it to be. Yeah. I, I agree with Colin. I just find it annoying and kind of trying to make up for scares where there aren't any. I don't think this yeah. is scary in the slightest. It's not a scary movie. There's no jump scares. There's no, I mean, you can't really, there's no slow moments of like somebody creeping through a hall until we wait for something. There's no suspense. No, no. Like they're definitely, all. they're not going for a creepy movie. Yeah. They, and then what you know what, this movie, you know what though? Like, 
there were there were a few moments that they would do like showing down the hall and then they'd like quickly jump to the next scene with a loud sound. And I'm like, I bet that was supposed to be a jump scare. It just doesn't play. That happened several times where I think they were trying to get those jump scares. It just didn't play as, as what they wanted. Well, their editing rhythm is also like they break up, um, dialogue, informational scenes that, you know, I mean, again, I haven't, this is a exercise in what if, because I haven't seen what the scene would play like if you just played the whole five minute scene, but they break like a five minute scene of two guys talking in a room up with three other scenes that are happening simultaneously. I mean, this is not like an uncommon editing trick, but this one, it just seems like they're cutting out of the conversation at really weird times to show somebody running around and then like, pow, 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 ghost, and then you cut to somebody else and pow, 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 something else is happening to them. And then back to the guys talking and then, you know, then it just keeps repeating on that kind of revolving. These are the shots, right? Or these are the scenes we're jumping back and forth to. And it's like, I am not entirely sure that I'm getting all the information that I'm supposed to be getting out of all three of these scenes. (laughs) You know, if you would have just presented it, it'd be like, okay, follow that. Okay. I follow this. Okay. I follow that. I don't know. Again, could be, maybe this is a personal thing. I don't know. But that is the, the impression that I had <laughs> while watching it. Um, so Cyrus is uh, collecting these ghosts. There's a big dramatic scene at the very beginning of the movie that takes place in a junkyard where they catch the juggernaut. Mm. Um, so these ghosts can actually um, impact the physical world, even though you can't see yes. them. And yeah, it's kind of like they're all poltergeists for some reason. And this one kills a bunch of guys at the opening thing, including Cyrus himself. Uh, you know, he gets killed at the beginning and leaving Matthew Lillard uh, on his own to basically find out what was going on with his house or something like that. There's also the appearance of uh, M. Beth Davids, who uh, horror fans will remember from Army of Darkness. She was also in Schindler's List um, and Fallen, I think she was in. Uh, she so. is, um, what's her position? She said what it was. Movie? I thought it was fucking hilarious and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it was like, she oh, was, a, a spirit. Um, Oh, what was it? It was something like a spirit emancipator or something like that. Right. I, I mean, hope that's what she said. It was, well, it was, <laughs> it was more complicated than that, but it, it was like, what are you saying? She's basically. She's basically like a PETA advocate, but for ghosts. I want you to hear that, audience. She's the PETA <laughs> advocate for yeah, ghosts. You can't treat these ghosts like this. This is cruel, and you must uncage them. This is exactly what happens in the movie, which exactly I thought was hilarious. That's, it's like so that might be a line of dialogue. He's trying to hunt them because they're ghosts, right? With uh, who knows what his purpose is at this point? We don't know, and uh, she is uh, like, ghosts must be set free. You can't cage these. <laughs> They're human beings. You can't put them in cages. Right. And it's like, but they that make one... a joke about it. Matthew Lillard does about maybe you should go find and throw red paint on rich ladies' fur coats. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, like uh, Greenpeace or whatever. Oh, no. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Um, so, ultimately, there are 13 ghosts, or 12 ghosts, captured within this thing. Um, who are the, some of them that you remember? Because they were all designed by K&B. Uh, yes. makeup effects group uh, who who do we have here who's on our roster the juggernaut and who's he the jackal. He's big hulking the, dude the, yeah the big hulking guy the, the, the jackal breaks people in half the, the angry jackal. princess yeah. you, you had a specific problem with this one Michaela. that's so fucking stupid everyone else has an actual name and she's the angry princess and like her look doesn't match that title at all she's a completely naked woman with a knife and black eyes, the devil's yeah, eyes. Yeah, that was uh, in, the, in, the, in the sketches. In the sketches, the angry princess was like hanging, but there was another ghost that was hanging. It was a, kind of that confusing. Was a woman, I believe. Yeah, yeah, but that's it was kind of confusing. I was like, the illustration is actually depicting the, um, this other ghost. Really, there's it nothing was, about her look or her ghost title that matches with her name at all. I know. Yeah, See, this one, is. But the I think that one is specifically, um, unfortunately for the movie, it uh, that more has to do more with her backstory, which we don't get at all in this movie. I, 
I feel like it should have been the vain princess because she like was looking in the mirror and that would have made more sense to me. I don't know. Yeah. She's Something covered like with cuts. At some point we see her in a bathtub that's full of blood. I mean, she's memorable because she's completely naked and has this like very pale um, and bloody uh, makeup on. But as Sean was saying, I remember when this DVD came out, uh, there was like a supplemental feature that went through every single ghost and gave, um, I don't know about uh, extensive backstories, but they all had stories that at was least like, like a minute and a half feature on each ghost. Yeah, like the torso, which is a crawling torso. You know, I no want to head. see more of that one. He was like a yeah. gangster that was cut up when he didn't pay somebody off, and they cut him apart and fed him to the fishes, and that's his story. You know that kind of stuff. The pilgrim is like this woman who was I can't remember like her whole deal. Uh, the I don't remember what the jackal was. The juggernaut's just a big creepy looking dude who goes around beating things up. There's also the uh, what was the guy with all the nails rammed into his that's, body? That's the hammer. The hammer. He's got a hammer for a fist. Um, he's got like sort of a Candyman backstory, kind of. Yeah. Well, he. I, I assume he was working on the railroad. Mm-hmm. I, I, I assume. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty sure like he was. Railroad spikes. Yeah, yeah it looks like railroad spikes. He's got a massive hammer. I assume he's like a yeah. John Henry situation. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, well, the ones that stood out to me, and maybe it was because they had uh, more screen time, or maybe it's a visual thing. But I mean, I remember the juggernaut. I remember the hammer. I remember the angry princess, the naked girl, and I remember the jackal because the jackal seems to be in a straight jacket and some kind of cage on its head. And it's basically, yeah. you know, you see the teeth and the eyes and the things like running around clawing at people. There's also yeah. uh, like a giant baby looking dude, a grown adult man, baby, and his The great child dwarf. and the dire mother. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and there's a kid in, uh, he's got like a Native American born. thing on him with, with the firstborn with a, uh arrow yeah. sticking out of his forehead. He died somehow like that. Um, I think he was playing... Uh, cowboys and Indians with someone and he got shot in the head. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah. it seemed like. Yeah, yeah, it's a tragic tragedy what happened yeah. to this kid. Um, the giant baby dude kind of reminded me of the giant baby dudes in Nothing But Trouble. Oh. Oh, God. Well, it's a trope that <laughs> goes back. It. Don't Beetlejuice it. Yeah. Talk about a scarier <laughs> movie, though. It goes Oof. back to, like, Pink Flamingos or probably something even beyond that. Who knows? Uh, um... Let's just watch Two Girls, One Cup for the show. There you go. Oh, God. I will do it. It's not 2007 (laughs) anymore, Sean. (laughs) You're right. That was a big year for me and Two Girls, One Cup. Well, that's ancient in internet time. Kids nowadays don't even know what that is. And just because it's on the internet, we want to remind people, it doesn't mean you have to watch it. Um, Yeah, if you don't know what we're talking about, don't don't look it up. Um, so all of these ghosts are imprisoned in this house and they're kept in there by glass force fields that have spells etched on them. Okay. Enter yes. our main protagonist. Uh, let's set this up. Who are we talking about? And what, what, how do they end up in this house? Monk. <laughs> uh, uh, oh shit. What's his name? Tony Shalhoub um, is a, is the father to two children. One of them is Shannon Elizabeth. Um, oh, and recently shit. they've Wait, come in. Let me stop you right there. Shannon Elizabeth is now on the Saturday Night Freak Show. Well, you know what we need right here? We need some kind of musical Music. stinger or something. <laughs> Listeners, if you want to send dun, us dun, something dun, dun, that we can use for the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame as we <laughs> induct these people and put their photographs up on our wall, joining the League of Celebrities that are up there. you got to be on a, a, a three movies that we've covered. Shannon Elizabeth was in Jack Frost, which we covered where she screwed a snowman. You got to see it. Uh, I cursed, think it screwed her. Oh, for a second, her. I thought you meant the Michael Keaton, Jack Frost, and I was like, <laughs> she was in that? And she <laughs> fucked him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's supposed to be a family film. I mean, that's a body horror movie of a different type. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was going to say no, the good one, but then I stopped myself. What <laughs> am I saying? Good job. Uh, well, also, <laughs> Jack Frost, 13 Ghosts, and Cursed. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sean. (laughs) Go ahead. I forget. I mean, we got the fucking snowman, and I completely forgot what I was talking about. You're introducing our main characters. Oh, yes. Um, uh, They've recently come into um, some uh, bad fortunes. Um, uh, His wife has died. Their mother has died in a fire in their house. Um, So they've lost their house. They've lost all of their things. 
Um, they're now, I mean, he's a math teacher, so he's not making much. They're all living in a very cramped apartment, I think, um, at this point. And so life is tough, uh, for these people. And then, uh, along comes uh, a lawyer one day saying that your uncle Cyrus Kirkos has died and he left you, you are his only remaining family and he left you a house in the middle of nowhere. There you go. So they all move, and there's little, the little tot. Also, they have a little kid. So basically, we're going to get all of these people into this house, which they're all ooh and ah, and you know, it's like it's a big glass house now, in the middle of nowhere. On on Amazon Prime, I looked at the description and it says that a family inherits an elegant mansion. I would not call this an elegant mansion by any means. No. Oh, well, why not? That's pretty no, elegant. This is, pretty this elegant. is not an elegant. No, this is a weird scientific archaea. <laughs> ar- no, this is a weird house. I would love this, this house. Is a sci- this is a science project. This is a weird fucking house. It's this is not so an elegant. elegant- this is not an elegant mansion. No, so I really elegant. like modern minimalist architecture, so I like would prefer this over like an old gothic house. Really? Oh yeah. no! I like all gl- like the all glass is pretty cool to me. I think like especially if you're living in the middle of the woods, like yeah, oh, as long as you have it. your own privacy, old gothic mansion where she can be friends with the ghosts inside. Yes, yeah. not it's, these ghosts. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Well, they get into this thing, and it's uh, introduced fairly early on that the special key that they're uh, that they are willed uh, when they turn it on actually activates a machine that resides in the basement. This is one of those big CGI machines that's made out of gears and all this other stuff, and it starts spinning, and that begins uh, a clockwork mechanism, which is designed to. Um, this is as we find out as the movie progresses. The clockwork mechanism is designed to open all of the uh, the doors containing all the ghosts and let them yes. free in the house. It, this is it locks the people in, and the doors are always reconfiguring and opening and closing, which allows like, certain hallways. It's like the staircases to, in Harry Potter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> Colin says, without having seen any of those movies, what do you I own them all? <laughs> The Harry Potter okay. films. I have the Harry the chest that came with all the yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Okay. Collector over here. So um <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you were the one who bought those, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so the uh but the idea is that basically this machine is designed in some way to open up uh, a doorway to hell. Right? Have I got this right? Well the, the yeah. eye of hell kind, is in the center kind of, the- of a doorway to hell. Okay. It's Set the, us the, eye control, the, the eye of hell, which sees both the past and the future. Well, did so we he say wants to activate it to control it? Did we say that the so the house, it turns out we learn this later uh, from Embeth Davids, who ends up inside the house. But we're not sure how the hell she got into a house that's been already locked down. But maybe that's implied by what we learn she said later. It. What? She said she slipped into a crack when the house is moving. Okay, well there you go. All right, okay. I missed it. But yeah, damn. but we find we find out later that that's not exactly true. Right. Um. So she is also in the house. So now it's Matthew Lillard, uh, Ambeth Davids, and the family, and the lawyer. Right. And the lawyer. Let's and not the, lawyer. the lawyer. Um. Who meets probably one of the best uh, scenes, I guess, in the in, in best dispatches in the movie and maybe in movie history. What happens to him? <laughs> He splits. He splits. <laughs> he, he, uh, he gets out of there one half at a time. Yeah, he, um, he gets he gets cornered in the basement by the angry princess, and the sliding glasses of the house uh, come together and split him in half. You Slice him. Bisect right down the middle. Yeah, they bisect but, him. Yes. But like uh, nice. it comes in from the side, not going in yeah. like between his eyes or yeah. anything. It goes in from the side of his he- you know side of his body and just like. Right. Uh, Kind of like so uh, that cool thing where it breaks the glasses off and they fall on each side. And- Can you imagine the sheer force of those doors to slice yeah, them like that? Because they're not yeah, they're really sharp. Yeah, yeah they're, not, they're sharp. not sharp. They're blunt. Like, yeah. They're like inch thick glasses or panes of glass. That, that, that had to and it didn't hurt. even crack. <laughs> no. That's good. It's ghost physics. They have, they have writing on them, Michaela. I mean, these are it's fortified. Yeah. Fortified by spirits, bisect the guy. So yeah, it's a pretty good effect because yeah, they do. I like the detail in that that his glasses fall off because they've been you know the the frames been in his touched. Eye. 
Yeah. His tie fall. Yeah. And then uh. he slides down <laughs> and we see the like his brain and all that stuff like still standing behind. And then that, yeah. you know, that section of him slides down. That's pretty good. Gross, yep. but pretty good. Love a goodbye section. Um the uh but so the 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 plan here is that all the ghosts will be unlocked one by one and that they're all eventually going to find their way to uh the big machine room in the center of the house where they will power the eye of hell right yes which will open up and allow something the, the person who controls this controls the world or what is controls the ability to see the future yeah. uh, basically i'm guessing is what he's I hoping know, I for was, i was getting uh, like a like a sauron saruman situation from it you know like <laughs> or a congo you know I mean? open eye yeah <laughs> <laughs> they do see that say that in hell there's a uh the eye that sees all or whatever yeah. this is the yeah. but it was no that was where i was getting at the house was actually designed by satan um, they say that the house was designed by some, uh, I don't know, some ancient dude who wrote it down while he was possessed by the devil, uh, right. actually designed the house. And then Cyrus got these, this manuscript of these plans and built the house to specs created by the devil. Designed by the devil and powered by the dead. There you go. That should be on the poster, but it probably wasn't. No, no, I, uh, Pray no. you don't become the fourteenth ghost or Ooh, something I'll, like that. <laughs> I'm gonna look at the taglines. I was like, do we have the taglines, Andy? I'm, I'm curious. The taglines. Yeah. Oh no. Okay, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh god. Uh, terror has multiplied. I think there's a math theme here. All uh, right. Yep. Thirteen. That I was get bad. Was, yep. Uh, misery. Loves I'm sorry. Company, what and what and what makes also thirteen? The Rockford uh, tagline. Misery what loves was it? company. Misery loves company, which is also the tagline oh, of Rockford. Oh. Lord. Uh, the only thing worse than being trapped in a house with a ghost is being trapped in a house with 13 ghosts. Okay, that's more in line. <laughs> that's that's not bad. Terrible. On the nose. <laughs> wow. Uh, Who was with them at the marketing department at Warner Brothers in 2001? Uh, oh, God. I mean, no. <laughs> they let the interns take over that day. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. There's 13 ghosts. Go. Uh, what's more terrifying <laughs> than a ghost? 13 of them. Uh there are ghosts around us all the time. Most of them don't want to hurt us, but there are exceptions. Wow. Oh, it didn't Matthew yeah. Lillard say that? Yeah. Basically, yes. I think that was his yeah. dialogue. Okay, well, and so... the last one is Terror Wants Company, which is dumb. Yeah. Well, they were really reaching to try and find something that they could stick on the poster there. Um, yes. This movie came out at Halloween, I believe, 2001. So this is like a month after uh, the whole... Uh, September 11th thing, so that maybe that had some effect on the. Oh, uh, so did they blame that on the box office maybe. like they did with everything that came out that year? Yeah, it was very tense. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason <laughs> glitter failed too, guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, I forgot about glitter. Yeah, not just because it was a bad movie. Bad timing. 9 11 ruined it. <laughs> well, the. um. Okay, so it's it's fairly uh, within like I would say maybe this is the first act, right? The first act gets our establishes the uh, the, the setting. And gets our characters in there, and then um, pretty much immediately Matthew Lillard starts sounding the alarm. He snuck in as a uh, like a repairman or something, but then he actually levels with everybody. It's like you got ghosts in the basement, you got to get out. The house starts sealing everybody in and begins yep. its mechanism, and family members get lost within the house because they wandered off, and then the doors have all sealed and all this other stuff. And so now it becomes for the next hour. They got to find the missing family members who are off wandering around the house. And now there are ghosts chasing them down in various spooky scenarios. Um, really does feel like for the next hour, they're just wandering around this house. Yeah. Like, I can't find where so-and-so is. Then we lose somebody else. And then we, somebody was just here with us. And now we can't find them. Uh, even though, again, you're in a glass house. This shouldn't be that very difficult to be able to see through. Uh, where you are here's a thing that i had a problem with this movie um i i'm saying i like the design of the house right when we actually do get some of these uh shots of some of these rooms it's very cool you know this glass and metal framed house with pulleys and stuff all over the place you can see the inner workings of it no plumbing right though, the gears and everything weird. um but 
frequently, and I don't know if this is the fault of the director or the cinematographer or what, but I could never establish any kind of geography. I never knew where we were. All the hallways look exactly the same. I couldn't yeah. tell. I mean, it's like, okay, are these guys upstairs or downstairs? At some point, somebody goes down a ladder, then they're doing something. I'm like, I don't know where the fuck we are, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and that's definitely a, um, a disadvantage this movie has because if there was some unique design, it would feel like maybe that progress was being made over this hour. But because everything looks the same, it always feels like we're just going back and doing the same thing, going back and doing the same thing for a whole hour. Like, I don't feel like we're going forward at all. Yeah, uh, but I mean, that's essentially, help. but I mean, yeah, the design doesn't help, but it's essentially what's happening. They go upstairs, they go to the library, then like, oh, we got to go back downstairs. Like, they're literally just going in circles. So, I mean, the design doesn't help. Yeah. But that is what they're doing. They're not making progress. They're just going in circles. They're like, you're the supposed to be disoriented. When Tony too. Shalhoub tries to go in the basement and Matthew Lillard stops him, I was like, no, can you please? Because then I can, like, actually get my bearings and figure out where the fuck we're at for once in this movie. And yeah. then just go back up the stairs. And I was like, oh, damn it. But usually, mm-hmm. like in a in a in a movie, like you know, when you have uh, a, a design like this, it's like, well, you you know, you have certain rooms that you're like, oh, that was the music room, and it looked like this, or uh, this is right. the, the library. I think I remember that because there's a long scene in there, or a dialogue scene, but I don't know how it's related to like the fr- or the front of the house, or the back of the house, or whatever. Right. I don't remember. This ever is the advantage kitchen. your uh, haunted house, your gothic haunted house has, Holly. Yeah. <laughs> It's like some things are kind of, we know that we see a bedroom once, uh, we see the bathroom once, we see a library once, and I think those are the only rooms that I can remember aside from the big, uh, maybe the foyer, because I think the foyer has a big, um, like, samurai statue in it. Yeah. But I I think we only go through there once, and then there's the big room with the spinning uh, discs on the floor that eventually become part of the machine. Um, Nope. But yeah. See, that's. See, that's why I like the like big gothic mansion houses, because they have personality. It feels like an, a living entity, whereas this house, it feels like a machine, which I know it's supposed to, but it, I think that's why I don't like it. I like the old house because it almost feels like a living, breathing thing, just because, you know, the each room has a distinction. It has personality, whereas this is just like one big box, one just one big machine, mm-hmm. and it doesn't move anything for me, even though it's constantly moving. It it just seems stationary to me. It's weird. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. And I think a lot of it is because like we're always in a a hallway, and all the hallways look the same because it's in the basement. Yes. Somehow this basement is a bunch of interconnected hallways. There's no room in the basement. It's just well, I suppose they have the containment cubes, but you can see through them. I'm like, I don't know where you know. Again, that, that's a problem. Um, mm-hmm. in the end yeah, of the movie, not even different, like lighting for each one. Like that would have been a nice distinction, but no, it's just dark. Yeah. Maybe right. Always. Like change the color of the writing on the walls or something. So we can tell something, them apart. Like something. different color for each ghost or something like that. For, for a haunted house movie, it's very well lit always. Yeah. Which I'm, used, I'm used to there being some darkness, but there's not a whole lot of darkness in this movie. And that might be, uh, you know, to the disadvantage of maybe that's why they cut away from the, the monsters so much is because they're under the light. Their makeup, you know, becomes like more apparent. That's light too. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, you know, Sean was saying that he thinks that they had confidence in what they were doing. Do you think they had confidence in how the ghosts were going to play on camera? You think so? You don't, I you think don't so, think that yes. the, you don't think the cutaways in, two, were... in 2001? I, uh, yes, I absolutely think that they were confident even, in what these things look like. Cause I still think they look for, cool, but even for 2001 though, like the, some of the makeup looks look pretty wrong. janky. Like I, I will admit how to, so? I will, it just looks very fake. It looks like when you it go to a fake. local haunted house, like that, it doesn't look like movie quality effects to me. Yeah, and I've seen. Well, I'm wondering what you want. The, I was wondering earlier what you want ghosts to look like. You say it looks more fake. realistic. Like it's a, it's a ghost. I'll give, like like. I'll, I'll give like you an example of appliances. I'll give you an example of appliances on someone's yeah. head. It just looks fake. It doesn't look tangible or real at all. I will give you an example. Ghost number four, which we haven't talked about yet, is a burn victim, and I would say that the makeup in Pet Cemetery, the original, looks better than in 2001, 13 Ghosts. I think so, too. Yeah, and they're also going for a, 
a good looking burn victim. Like the burns are beautiful for whatever reason <laughs> on this woman. It's it's weird. It, it does not look good. And I'm like, I've seen this done better like 20 years before this. They're, yeah, they're definitely uh, realism uh, is definitely not what they're going for. I don't think I don't, uh, no. I, the, the hammer guy. It looks like a bunch of rubber pieces sticking out of his head. It doesn't look like real metal or anything at all. It does. It, it looks pretty. Yeah, that one, it, it definitely looks like they could do that in a local fun house. Like for real. I will say that the jackal still works for me. I thought it was creepy when I saw this when it came out, and I still think it's creepy. I think that, that, that one is because most of his, like, face is covered, you know? I think that he's wearing, like, the kind of big, like, contraption on his head really kind of helps that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's part of why it's so creepy is the, right. is the on her head, like, and, and the fact that she's, like, animalistic, you know? Mm-hmm. So that one does still play for me. I will give you that. Well, all of these... Uh, characters i mean basically they seem like uh i don't know if you guys remember the uh like mcfarlane uh toys the twisted souls that he did with clive barker the dark uh uh, wizard of oz or whatever um but uh they all look like they could be like you can make action figures out of this right which is probably what they were hoping for are there action figures like you figure NECA or somebody would have had like the 13 ghosts lineup i was gonna say yeah you make make in you make a good point that these are like classic model action figures. I, these are I can't imagine there's n- figures out there. Nineties McFarlane toys. This like mm-hmm. it's definitely of that. There's got to be people selling these at conventions. Yeah. Well, we also uh, oh we forgot to mention the nanny is also a part of this. Uh, this is uh, played <laughs> by uh, she's a rapper. Oh, and I, I forgot what her yes, name was. And that is her rapping in the credits. In the end of the movie, and one of the worst rap songs ever made, we think. But uh, <laughs> what was it? It was like Ra Ra Digga, I think, is her name. Ra, yeah. Um, so wait, was she Tony Shalhoub's nanny? Yes. Yeah. So he's a poor math teacher, but he has a nanny. Right. Can afford a nanny. That's why okay, I'm like, man. why didn't they just make her like the new wife or something, yeah, or you know, why not? just add another uh, sibling? Because it turns out we can't make her the wife because his wife is the fourth ghost. It turns out evil Uncle Cyrus has captured his wife and put her down there uh, as well. So she's the burn victim who's wandering around. And this now gives uh, Tony Shalhoub, um, and aside from just getting out of the house, it's like you got to free his wife's spirit who's also trapped here. Uh, Matthew Lillard. He bites it at some point and trying to save uh, Tony Shalhoub. At some point, they're trying to maneuver in order to protect themselves. One of these big uh, sheets of glass with the uh, spells written on it through the house in order to use that as a a protective shield um, against the onslaught of the supernatural menace. Uh, It turns out that evil Uncle Cyrus actually is still alive. Uh, Was this a surprise to anyone when this happened? Because we, the math no. does math and figures it out. <laughs> That's right. There's 12 <laughs> ghosts. If I'm going to be the 13th ghost, because you know, the idea is that you? he will have to sacrifice himself and become the 13th ghost. And finally, this is all part of the evil uh, plan that Cyrus has constructed to kill his own nephew. But it turns out oh. <laughs> Cyrus is. Although it, it didn't throw him when Matthew Lillard shows up as a ghost. that He was OK with that one. Well, he saw him die, so he knows he's a ghost. But then wouldn't he become the 13th ghost? He yeah, dies in the house. wouldn't he yeah. be number well, 13? Just because you need 13 doesn't mean, you know, there can't be extra ghosts around. Yeah, yeah but wouldn't right. the next person to go be the 13th? Why does it skip someone? Because he has well, to yeah. die in no, a very the 13th specific... 13th is only because he's got to make the sacrifice. Yeah, he has to die for love. Matthew Lillard made a sacrifice. That's true. Yeah, not, not the specific one. Oh my god, that's such bullshit. Fuck this movie. What, a, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is when when um, Salieri shows up as a ghost, he's all like, this doesn't add up. But when Matthew Lillard shows up, he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why doesn't he question that? Because it's after the fact, I think. Again, he's, <laughs> and he saw Matthew Lillard die. He knows he's a ghost. You know he can't be alive. <sighs> you don't get what I'm saying. <laughs> He because would be the 13th. He's already ghost, done the counting Sean. and figured it out. Yeah, but it makes sense. Right. Uh, it does. So, <laughs> Sean, you just can't say it makes sense. It <laughs> makes sense. It makes sense. It have you, have you seen the world we live in now? I can do that. <laughs> this movie was made before that, though. <laughs> well, uh, but my opinions are made now. It's a movie, and we still have to apply logic at some point mm-hmm. to it. Or it's like, nope, just park your brain and have fun. I think, which is what this I movie's guess- going for, because it's all hyped up on its. Uh, 
People it's say momentum. that when they know a movie is bad, but they still like it. Exactly. Um, okay. Maybe well, we didn't process 9-11, Michaela. I don't know. There's uh, <laughs> also... We really process 9-11. <laughs> so, M. Beth Davids is in the, you know, so she's basically there to tell, uh, you know, it's like she's got the inside scoop being the ghost liberator. She, it, she wants to set them all free, which I thought was incre- extremely irresponsible at this, at that point in the movie when she said, cause it's like, clearly these are violent ghosts that are going around stabbing, butchering, hammering and hacking people up. And she's like, no, I want to yeah. set them all free. And you're clearly, like, what? Clearly <laughs> something else is afoot. Yeah. It turns out later she's actually in cahoots with evil Salieri. And I don't know what she planned to get out of it exactly because he's going to be the only one to reap the rewards of stepping into the eye of hell right in the center she's of the hoping to be like standing at his side as he's ruling with the eye of hell she wants to be Satan's sure right hand man. ultimate goal right probably she wants to be the queen of the damned well yes of course he turns on her because that's what all these evil sons of bitches always do and he has her smashed between two panes of glass and she in a cg yeah. explosion gets all crushed um it's fun the end of the movie Basically seems to be telling us a moral story, which if I got it correct here, is that Salieri is uh, a guy who is, uh, you know, he's he's always been doing stuff to try. What do you keep calling him? Salieri Salieri from from Amadeus from from Amadeus killed Mozart. Oh, okay. See our last action hero episode. Did you you not see Amadeus? I've never seen Amadeus. I get the joke. (laughs) That was his name. You've never seen it. No, I, only, I only know Rock Me on the Deus, and that's it. Oh, there you go. Well, all you need is Amadeus Falco, knowledge. and you're going to go. Um, what? But anyway, <laughs> he. Uh, wait, now I lost my train of thought. What was going on? I'm oh, sorry. so yeah, the, the moral being uh, don't be uh, someone who is uh, always in search of. Uh, uh, what am I trying to go with here? Like, he, he's basically motivated to achieve the, his ultimate dream and forsaking everything else in the process and becomes a sociopath. Right. Yeah. That's bad. Uh, what is good is the, uh, you know, the human touch, even though you're a penniless math teacher, family is the most important thing and saving love is the uh, most important emotion that you can feel. And so I think Michaela's Kayla's going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> what is that not what that, i just see her shaking her head in rage right this, this is like the, the simple moral of the story at the end of this movie right i just yeah i feel like sure. you doing a lot of legwork for this movie colin that well, i'm not sure it deserves but. well i'm saying that that's there because like it really isn't about anything else it's kind of using these like moral uh you know types in order to define its villain and its uh protagonist right and at the mm-hmm. end of it it turns out that nobody, I guess Tony Shalhoub does actually jump through the hoop of, uh, you know, spinning death and survive. Oh my God, it's so stupid. He's so we just teacher. saw someone else get hacked up by this and he's able to jump perfectly so that he misses all the hoops. Well, Salieri gets math thrown teacher. into math it. Math teacher, I think you guys said he's it. He's a math teacher. Yeah, math he teacher. timed it out. He knows geometry, damn it. Yeah. He, and I think that's probably more physics than anything. He's Yeah, math. This is why you math? gotta, you gotta yeah. study your math, kids. I mean, that's where, you know, secret language yeah, of the yeah. universe. Yeah, all us high schoolers were like, I'll never use this in life. You don't know. That's you come right. across a glass house in the middle of the woods with a, a devil machine in it, and you may need it. That's right. <laughs> Heed the advice of Christopher Walken as the angel Gabriel in the prophecy when he said, think, stick to your I, math, kids. It's the language of the universe. Um, yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think this was one of the writers of this was a math teacher. Yeah, he's like math teachers can be heroes. We can be cool. You know who was? Uh, <laughs> you know who was an uncredited writer on this movie? Yeah, uh, James Gunn. You are correct. So we can blame it all on him. <laughs> That's right. So James Gunn wrote some of the witty dialogue. I assume he's that we experienced some bad movies. And, <laughs> well, maybe this was like coming out of trauma days or whatever. I mean, um, he wrote that Scooby Doo movie too. That's also true. Oh, which yeah. also he's starred written Matthew some Lillard. bad stuff, especially early on. Yeah. Um, everyone's got to start somewhere right Mm -hmm. well all of the ghosts end up attacking F. Murray Abraham that's why he gets thrown into the machine and gets vivisected right Shalhoub makes the jump you know pure hearted thing and he jumps in there but what actually happens is the day is actually saved by the nanny who just goes down into the boiler room 
and starts throwing all the switches, which overloads the machine because it can't go forward, backward, forward, backward. What am I going to do? And it just like pops gears and throws them out. And those cause explosions when they get chucked out. And then the whole house explodes. But our family is able to escape unscathed from this. How I don't know how they managed to this feat because that thing was, I mean, I saw it. It's blowing out all the glass windows with fire. <laughs> the whole yeah, house is huge and huge gears are flying through the house huge mm-hmm. um Disney i world. i ass- i assume they were protected by ghost number four. Oh, 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 oh this may be sure maybe wife saves the day because she also heals when we see her last she's the last ghost to leave we get to see all the ghosts like kind of walking in a parade away from the house and fading away into nothing as they've been freed to go out and Murder, torture, Man, kill, or whatever. That's 12 sequels right there. What were they thinking? Yeah. <laughs> but the family is uh, is reunited with mom, and she gets to say a final goodbye and uh, vanishes into the ether. Uh-huh. And uh, then we get our kicker, which is uh, the nanny saying, like, basically, I'm done with all this shit, and I'm going to go, I'm done being a nanny, and cut to black, and we hear the song, sung by the nanny. Rod Digga. It's a really bad song. Really what bad. Good. Yeah. What was the what was the chorus there, Sean? I'm not singing for you. I'm not rapping for you. <laughs> you tried to rap the ball tomorrow. Watch the little puppet, Colin. <laughs> but you're the you're the vocal talent on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We can always sure. count on Sean to bring us home with a song, especially. <laughs> oh, is that what I'm known for? Is that my reputation? <laughs> to bring I'm us sorry, home with when, a song. When has he done this? <laughs> what the ballad of Harry Warden? Uh, oh, that's dead right. Heat. Oh, that's such a great song. Yeah. Dead Heat. Yeah, Dead, dead heat. heat. It doesn't go like you know? that. It turns out when I was rewatching it, it's like we got it all. <laughs> we got it weird. I don't care. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, well, that uh, that brings us to the end of, of Thirteen Ghosts. But tell you what, listen, wait, you guys have anything else to add before we go to uh, oh, our wrap ups? Yeah, they are. They're, they are making figures. People out there are making figures of the 13 ghosts. Wait, are now, like, currently to be... No, they, well, they have. Wait, oh, that's not a good... There's, like, the torso. There's a bunch. Okay, but they're not, like, no official stuff. This is, like, these guys who make... Yeah, they're all custom okay. figures. But people are making them. Well, they are making them. All they right. do like them. You can order 13, your favorite 13 ghost characters. Somewhere. Probably that comes with a little insert that explains their entire backstories. Collect them all. I would almost guarantee it. <laughs> okay, well, uh, tell you what, listener, we're going to review this movie individually. We're going to tell you if we uh, recommend that you see it. Is it. Thumbs up, thumbs down, four stars, one star. You're going to find out what everybody thought about this movie individually. How many ghosts out of 13 ghosts do you give this movie? Oh, bam. There you go. We got a new review scale for this. <laughs> And which go? Uh, oh, that's too much work. But first, we're going to answer some of your mail. In order to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman, and his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. He kind of, well, no, I can't say that. Never mind. We're, okay. We're, we're never going to know now. Okay. <laughs> Just cut. Nope, you'll never know. Just cut that out and we'll all be good. All right. Thanks, Igor. Um, so we want to tell you how you can get a hold of us. Uh, you can write to us on and follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Giant Freak Show. Or if Twitter's your thing, we're there too. At Sat Freak Show. You can also email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And join the fun on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Death by Stereo writes in and says, wait a (laughs) damn minute. I never knew this was a remake. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Boom. Go watch the original. It's not bad. Uh, Monty Montague says, while the movie is kind of garbage, I always did like the ghost designs. I remember watching this so much as a kid with my brother on long car rides. This is definitely a, a, a kid horror movie but isn't it rated r it's rated r oh yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't mean I don't, I, boobs and people getting vivisected 
Yeah, I thought I about don't, throwing I don't this to the kid, and then, and then I was like, "Oh wait, no, no, kid." <laughs> yeah, I don't mean it's kid appropriate. I mean it's a movie that kids would like. Oh yeah, like, yeah. You know what I mean? That yeah. you grew up with, be like, "I loved that when I was a kid." Yep, oh, yeah. that's what I mean. You can sneak see this movie; you'd probably love it when you're like uh, yeah, thirteen. That's years what old. I mean. Uh, Travis Legler says we're in store for Matthew Lillard trying to, at moments, act it up like Bruce Campbell, but with far less charm. However, this is a fun turn your brain off movie. There are enough gory visuals and zany logic to make it enjoyable. Have a few beers and kick back and laugh. It's a fun time. Yeah, I definitely laughed a few times. There you go. Michael Whitaker says, okay, I admit it. I'm the one guy that actually likes this movie. There isn't anything about it that offends my horror sensibilities. There's a bit of nostalgia factor for me on this because I would have been, uh, it would have been around the time I finished my two year college and spent most of my free time going to the movies or working. It's certainly not dating or getting a life started. Heck, I don't even think I was 21 yet, so I couldn't go to bars. So yeah, I do watch this movie every time it pops up on television. I had nothing in my life, so I watched 13 Ghosts. <laughs> it turns out you're not alone. <laughs> I know, because Simon Carter says, I may have been drinking, but I dig this movie. It was fun. Sure, it's simple, but fun nonetheless. I'll take a fun movie over a deep movie any day. And deep is in quotes. Okay. All right. Which yeah. possibly could mean there are no deep movies. They're just quote unquote deep movies. That's there are definitely fun. movies that think they're deep that aren't. Uh, Grant Parrish says, I really got into the black Zodiac aspect of this movie and would have loved for that to have been more textual, like the princess only kills people looking in a mirror or the doting mother kills you if you get between her and her son. The seed of the idea was pretty cool. And the horror movie wanted to be more about the house, which I found to be less cool. I agree. I think it would have been way point. cooler if it had been more about the ghost. Yeah, that's yeah. a very good I, point. Yeah, because I agree. That's the- most interesting part that they don't go into yeah the actual ghosts right yeah, yeah. yeah. it's all about the, the house of the 13 ghosts it is more about features. the house and the people than the ghosts special features and on the website and stuff like that that's why you got to keep on digging it's a you know augmented reality experience uh brett zemecki says the movie is a guilty pleasure of mine i enjoyed matthew lillard in it and tony shalhoub it is just so incredibly 2001 and you gotta love that 2000 stank <laughs> I think it's more of a Dark Castle stank than a 2000 stank. Well, Rich Martinez says it's not a bad flick. There were crea- they were creative with the ghosts, and more importantly, Shannon Elizabeth is in it. Keep up the good work, freak show. Y'all kick ass. <laughs> Do people go see movies for her? Well, I mean, they yes. used to. When was uh, American uh, Pie? She's riding her American Pie. Yeah. <laughs> she's on that 70s show at this point, too. In 2001. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, but even then, like nobody saw American Pie just because of her. Yeah, no but, one went to go see it. No, they, no, they remembered her the after. Time because yeah, of her. because of her. There and you they, go. They knew. That's <laughs> and they're like, who is this? Shannon Elizabeth. <laughs> And then her name was made. Nicholas Capriola writes in and says, "Yes, this movie is good. I don't care what anyone says." <laughs> mm-hmm. And Robin Linneman Silverberg says, "This is a guilty pleasure." Uh, last that's, week, that's more positives than negatives. On, on those I know comments. that was uh, pretty much the only one we got was what it was. Uh, it's kind of garbage. Um, right. Last week, we watched a movie called City of the Living Dead. Uh, a listener named Outloa said, I love you guys are doing this one. Uh, Fulci, Lucio Fulci is one of my favorite directors. His best movie is probably Don't Torture a Duckling, but I favor his 80s stuff. Enigma and Conquest are standouts and super underrated. I love the podcast. Greetings from uh, Alex from the Netherlands. Oh, Alex. oh cool. From the Netherlands. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's, That's awesome. Our first Netherlands, uh, listener. Thank Fancy. you for writing in. That's pretty Thank good. Thank you. Awesome. I, I own Don't Torture a Duckling. Conquest, I have to get a copy of. That's his science fiction fantasy epic. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah, oh it's crazy. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Karate Warrior 2 said, God damn, I love me some goofy Italian schlock. But I tapped out at that waking up in the coffin bit. I knew some bad shit was coming next. Films like this had the power to legit scare my scar my mind in the past. Oh, and fuck that seventies aesthetic too. I'm not a fan of that shit either. Oh no, it was good. <laughs> that coffin bit though, I did, I was worried they were gonna hit that actress in the teeth. Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. it was very unnerving. And he missed yeah, the girl think- puking her guts out. 
Uh, the guy getting drilled through the head and the maggot storm. I, I don't think with the, the coffin and the pickaxe, I don't think uh, they knew how to cheat it. No, like, I don't think that was in their repertoire. So I'm pretty sure she's like this close to getting clubbed in the head. They're, They're like, just like, do it. don't lift your head up. Lay as far back as you can. Right. <laughs> Uh, Mike Welch also writes in, he says, okay, guys, I have to say the city of the living dead is quite possibly the best HP Lovecraft movie ever made. Uh, I'm saying that it wasn't based on an HP Lovecraft, but it was, uh, like inspired by Dunwich right. and all that stuff that it mentions. Right. He says, there's no tentacles or fishmen, but the unexplained sense of doom and investigators trying to find an answer is very much like an HP story. And even the end, which I can't stand is like one. Also, when it was uh, Gates of Hell, my dad rented it. Ha, ha, ha. Is there a difference between the two films? He's asking between because it came out here as Gates of Hell. Uh, No, it's the same movie, uh, just retitled, although the American version may have had some of the gore uh, trimmed. There you go. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. That's right. You want to see someone puking out guts for five minutes straight. I mean, Um, I do. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) About... um, Let's see about after earth, which is a movie that we watched two weeks ago. We said on the show that Jaden Smith, who stars in it, uh, sought emancipation from his famous parents. The year after the movie came out, they knew Feld writes in and says, wow, it was that bad, huh? Uh, (laughs) Commodore Kaz says that movie was awful. Uh, Peter Gatt says M night Shyamalan's fall from grace happened after the sixth sense. In my humble opinion, uh, okay. Sander Antoinette says, uh, Oh no, sorry. Neil gum says so often we're talking about the, uh, the, we were talking about the CG creatures, right? Yeah. Neil gum says so often they're a CG blob that it's hard to even get a grasp of. This one reminds me of Cloverfield. And while I like Clover, it's still hard to get a complete picture of its form. And Sander Antoinette says, yeah, quality control on CGI is pretty low. Even on big budget movies, I remember seeing one of the bad guys in the new Star Wars and thinking, is that the mummy? (laughs) Uh, Appiel also said he loved this podcast episode on After Earth. Uh, Four weeks ago, we're going to go back four weeks for Congo. Has it been that long already? Uh, Yeah. Nathan wrote in. And said, I spent my childhood reading every Michael Crichton book I could get my hands on, but in college I reluctantly dropped him from my hero list because I heard he was a climate change denier. Recently, though, I had a wild hair to look up interviews he did while he was alive, and it turns out to lump him in with deniers is to grossly misrepresent his position. He, in fact, did not deny that climate change was occurring. He simply suggested that humanity would adapt as the planet changed and that climate change wouldn't be as catastrophic as some thought. His was not an anti-alarmist, or his was an anti-alarmist point of view and a nuanced position of point of view. And although time will tell if he was right or not, I don't think that deifying him can be justified. And I feel bad for having once done so, based solely on hearsay. Well, was, now you have, you have confessed yeah. and you are released of your sins. So go for it. Yes, <laughs> we have that power. I think, <laughs> but deifying, <laughs> deifying <laughs> means you <laughs> elevate the guy. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to, but you did. There you go. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so now, thank you for sticking with us through the mailbag. Now we've gotten to the most uh, entertaining part of the show. We're going to go around. We're going to throw this movie on the table and then attack it like a pack of wild dogs. We're going to go around the room, starting with Holly. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to start with you. We can't start out on the negative note, so we're going to hold off on my kid. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Holly, what did you think of tonight's movie, 13 Goats? Um, so I had not seen this since it came out. And frankly, I didn't remember hardly any of it. Um, there was really the only part that rung any bells or tr- triggered any memory uh, when, when Matthew Lillard's going down the hallway and we first get a glimpse of all the different ghosts. Um, that triggered a memory. I was like, okay, I do remember watching this, but that's really where it ended. So it was kind of like watching it for the first time tonight. Um, and I had, I had pretty low expectations. I thought it was going to be terrible. Um, and then I saw some of our listeners writing in that said it was guilty pleasure and how much they liked it. And I was like, okay, well, Maybe it's not going to be so bad. Um, and it really wasn't as bad as I, as I thought. Um, it was actually kind of fun. <laughs> I, I can see why this is a guilty pleasure. Now, don't get me wrong. It's terrible. It's the, the makeup does not 
hold up. I, I still, I still feel like they could have done a lot better in 2001, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but some of the some of it worked like I, like we had talked about I, the jackal still works for me i still think that's scary um but for the most part i i wasn't too impressed with the with the makeup i like the design i like that each one of them had their own personality and i agree with with uh, our listener that wrote in saying that he would have wanted the movie to be more about that you know i i don't think i think the house design is cool you know obviously i've said that I'd rather a haunted house be like a old gothic house, but I thought the design was very cool. It was really impressive. Um, but it was too bland, too basic. It's, it's monotonous. It's, it's every room is the same. It's repetitive. So I don't think the story should have been based around it. There's not enough to base it on. I would have liked, you know, you had so much potential. You've got 13, you've got 13 ghosts and you have the eye of hell and your whole story is about a glass house. You've got so much more that you could work with. And that's, I think that's where it falls short for me um, is that they could have done so much more with it and it could have been so interesting. However, there were parts that were really funny and I liked that right off the bat, we got several kills. That was a good intro. Um, obviously we talked about the, the bisecting of the lawyer was pretty impressive. I was not expecting that from a 2000 <laughs> lawyer movie. split. Yeah, the lawyer split. I was not expecting that from a 2001 horror movie. I mean, we all have we watched a lot of late 90s, early 2000s horror, and it doesn't usually have a lot of horror elements. It's not usually real graphic. Um, but this one, I thought, actually had a decent amount of gore to it, um, which I was pleasantly surprised with. And I don't know. I, I can definitely see why this is a guilty pleasure for so many people. I think it's a fun movie. It's like I said, terrible movie. It's stupid, but. I kind of liked it. I kind of had fun with it. So I think I'm going to recommend 13 Ghosts. <laughs> I didn't think I would. <laughs> really didn't. It's the great thing Michaela, about the freak show. <laughs> should, we, should we go to Michaela or should we wait? <laughs> go to Michaela. You tell me. Michaela. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, I already know I'm on the downslope with listeners right now between After Earth and now my opinions on this. So I'm fully expecting a barrage of uh, of, un- of emails about my unpopular opinion next week. But <laughs> they, um, then you have to show them what the um, the Rick and Morty thing you showed us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the meme that said, your booze yeah. mean nothing to me. I've seen what makes you cheer. <laughs> exactly. That's true. Um, it, like, I saw this movie for the first time 10 years ago. I hated it then. I still hate it now. It, I don't like Dark Castle movies. I, I was the only one that also didn't recommend House on Haunted Hill. I just don't like these types of movies. I don't like the tone. I don't like the style. I don't like, I feel like they're barely fleshed out plot wise. I think this movie focuses on all the wrong things. I don't understand the point of having a mythology behind 13 ghosts if it means nothing to the story. Like This movie could have just been about four ghosts for how much they use them all. Um, Very true. Very true. Yeah, it's Tony Shalhoub's not a leading man. That no. casting choice is I'll never understand. And it it just I haunted house movies. The more and more I watch, the more I'm like, maybe these just aren't my thing. I'm just not into them. I, this movie's not scary at all. The whole thing about like you can see the ghosts if you wear the glasses. It's like, well, why why even wear the glasses then? Just don't wear them. It's just it seems like all the problems in this movie are so easily avoided, and it. <sighs> I, yeah, this just isn't for me. I don't care if you like it, but don't don't try and make an argument to me that it's worth watching because the house looks cool or the creature designs are good because <laughs> that's not a good enough reason to watch a movie. You need to it needs to have a little bit more. And um, I mean, I watch that TV show Face Off a lot, the like uh, makeup competition show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like amateurs pull off better looks in three hours than this movie on that show all the time. So it's a great show. Yeah, it's. I, I can't recommend it. It's not for me. Um, and, I, yeah, I really don't see my opinion changing on this anytime soon. <laughs> Colin? We'll wait 10 years and give it another <laughs> rewatch. Put it in the Halloween movie rotation. Um, all right. So, uh, well, I mean, I guess I disagree with Michaela on the the the, uh, the creature design. I actually did like those. I thought those did, uh, you know, they were impressive to me. I like the individual designs I could pick out, like which ones were, which it just, I didn't get to see them much. And you're right. There's uh they don't re- it could have done with four ghosts. I mean, there's really only four main ones that you see. 
but I think they all make cool action figures. But does that make a movie? And all this mythology behind them, it's like the mythology doesn't exist in the movie. So that's a fail. Um, the house is a spectacular, spectacular production piece of production design. Is that worth seeing the movie for by itself? No, because they don't cover it correctly. Uh, you know, you know, like I said, I'm not, I have no sense of geography. It's just, it was within the first 20 minutes when you're like, Ooh, ah, and wow. And then once they actually settle into the bulk of the movie, which is, I think like a good 45 minutes, an hour of running around through hallways that all look exactly the same, that newness wore off. And then I was like, okay, so what's wrong with this movie? Like, where is the, where's the problems? And I think, you know, you're saying Tony Shalhoub is a perfectly capable actor. He's actually better than that. He's an award winner for a lot of the stuff that he's done. I can see why, because in this movie, he is hysterical for a lot of it, which and pushed to the edge of uh, emotions, but he doesn't occupy scenes where he, like they're always cutting away from it or they're showing, you know, him breaking down after, uh, uh, who, after I think he saw his wife for the first time and then they cut away from it. It's like, none of it ever makes an impact. That's not his fault, but it's just the, the director and the editor. And that's John Carpenter's editor too. That's Edward uh, Wachowska or whatever, who I can't remember his actual name, but he's worked with John Carpenter for, uh, years. Uh, the editing rhythm in this movie is just like annoying and uh in your face with the strobe effects and it minimizes the effect of the story itself uh but i do think shaloub is uh, unfortunately miscast or you know because he's not a leading man i don't think he doesn't have the uh, charisma i think to pull off this particular role um i think and then it was like, well, is it the screenplay? You know, is that the problem? Is, uh, is you know, and I think, uh, I don't know if I can fault the screenplay. I mean, it's bad. Okay, so let's say, yeah, I, I do fault the screenplay for being bad. But the biggest problem that I have with it is the screenplay is not written to take place in a glass house. This is what I'm thinking. As I'm going back through it, I'm like, the screenplay is written, assuming that they're in a regular house. And somewhere somebody got the idea after the screenplay was written they're like you know what would be cool is if we production designed this glass house then they tailor the screenplay to it but it's like the the transplant didn't take or something because <laughs> it like doesn't make it doesn't the the glass house is like a separate thing it doesn't you know uh, uh, fit within the story of the movie and you know you're saying well yeah but it's a machine colin what are you talking about it's like it totally functions but it's like they're supposed to be running around aliens like that's what the movie felt like it's like an action movie there's aliens in the basement that are jumping out of the walls and stuff but it's a glass house you know it's like all of this stuff is open and there's really no place to hide and so they have to manufacture ways i don't know it was just annoying uh the tempo of the movie uh the it just uh, the whole thing was just grating and annoying to me uh, yes i do say that the production design and the monster design are cool that is not the reason to see a movie uh, I gave ha House on Haunted Hill, I think, was like, of the Dark Castle movies, um, that was the passing grade one. Like, I enjoyed it, even though it had some serious flaws, especially toward the end of that movie, but I'd still recommend that. Uh, all the other ones fall below that into the don't recommend territory. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to say you don't need to see 13 Ghosts. It's kind of a train wreck of a movie. Sean, what do you think of... 13 goes. All right. Um, uh, I brought it here tonight cause I haven't seen this movie in a while. Um, this was one of those movies when it came out, uh, that me and my brothers watched all the time. Um, I can still, uh, and I, I still remember most of it watching it through tonight. There's still some parts that I can still quote from it. Um, I enjoyed it back then. Uh, now, uh, I do see, you all made a lot of good points and I do see the very major flaws with this movie. Um, Colin, I think you're right. It does feel like the glass house is an afterthought. They really should be running around a dark house with ghosts. Um, uh, you are also right that the, uh, ghost design and cool house, uh, are not reasons to watch a movie. Uh, even though um, I do appreciate those two parts of this movie a lot. I do like the um, designs of the ghosts. I still think they're pretty cool. I still think uh, I still enjoy watching them. Um, we are missing a lot of opportunity. Like we said, the, with using the ghosts, 
I mean, the movie's called 13 Ghosts, not Big Glass House with ghosts in it. So why they didn't use more of the ghosts, kind of use their backstories more in the story of it. Um, uh, I mean, they fucked up. They didn't, uh, they had this opportunity and they didn't utilize it in the best way. Um, there's, uh, it is, it is also a very loud movie. Like, um, uh, the editing's loud, the music's loud. Um, they're using that in place of any sort of, uh, creepiness or any attempt to make you scared or uneasy. They do that with the editing, which is not, I, I, which is not a nice thing to do to your audience. I don't think. Um, so I, I recognize the movie's got problems. Um, but watching it tonight, I still had fun watching it. Um, again, it's a hard one to pin down for me and maybe just put it all towards um, being a big fan of this when I was younger. But I still had fun watching tonight. Um, maybe um, uh, Monk is not a leading man, but I was I, I, I still like these characters um, in this movie. I don't think they're. I don't know. I never got mad at them for doing like stupid shit. I don't think they fall into that category. There's characters in horror movies. I absolutely hate because they just continue to keep doing stupid shit. And you're wondering, you know, what's the point of these characters? Um, but I do like these characters. I'm kind of glad they got rid of the little kid earlier on in the movie. Cause he was kind of, you know, pointless. Um, but I think there's enough here, at least for me, um, that I still enjoy watching this movie. Um, I got my feel of it tonight and it's going to be a little while before I watch it again, but I will watch it again. I has still had a good time watching it tonight. So, uh, in the end, I'm still going to recommend 13 ghosts. There's that Blu-ray coming out special edition. Find out everything there was to know <laughs> about know. the making if of it all, 13 if ghosts it falls down to $13 someday. I'll get it. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. So it's a two, four, two against, I think is how it broke down. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, next week, we are going to be watching a movie that's chosen by Holly. What are we going to watch next week? Um, well, the dear, Bra- <laughs> oh, no. dear Brailers, we have a lot of discussions off mic about movies that we're going to bring and whether we should bring them or not. It's not, I'm not know. saying it's, I'm not saying it's the summer of Swayze, but what is summer without Swayze? We're going to watch Steel Dawn. <laughs> oh, <right>. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, know, it Colin. took me a minute. Yeah. Colin, for, for all you know, this is a, a, a thing for us where we all pick a Swayze movie. Yeah. Hey, Ghost is still <laughs> on the is, table, just, man. This, I know, yeah. this is the setup. I thought it was going to be Ghost. Like, I know, that's why I said it. <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay. Ghost is not off the table. Michaela's right. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to watch the but post I watched, apocalyptic. I watched the trailer for Steel Dawn after we talked about it. I was like, yeah, we're fucking watching this movie. Oh, it's just uh, the, the Mad the, Max. Uh, yeah. Mad Max one? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yay. Yeah. <laughs> All okay. right. So Patrick Swayze as a Mad Max type has to negotiate the wasteland in Steel Dawn. I hope his name yeah. is like Barton Steel. What a great name. Max Steel, <laughs> something like that. Could be. His name's going to be Max Dawn for all you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I haven't seen it. None of us have, I think. Mm-mm. All right. This will be a first timer. Steel right. Dawn from 1987, I think, next week on the Saturday so. Night Freak Show. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>